So you guys have all these great posters up here. It's quite wonderful, you know. A wonderful history of resistance. And you got Aunt Molly Jackson up there. How many of you know who Aunt Molly Jackson was? So what good's the poster, I ask you, huh? So Aunt Molly Jackson was a midwife and union organizer in Bell County, Kentucky in the 1930s. And uh, was and she was an organizer for the National Miners Union, which is the Communist Party union that opposed the United Mine Workers of America, led by John L. Lewis. And um, she was also from a long family of, of ballad singers, traditional ballad singers and song makers. Uh, her half-brother, Jim Garland, was a working coal miner who wrote a wonderful song called I Don't Want Your Millions, Mister, which is basically about, yes, I actually do. Right? And, and uh, she's also kin to Sarah Ogan Gunning who wrote, um, I am a union woman as brave as I can be. I do not like the bosses, and the bosses don't like me. Right? So wonderful, a singing family. And um, she was run out of she was run out of Bell County, you know, by the gun thugs and the coal operators, and she settled in New York City, on the Lower East Side, what we now call Louis Saida, and right, right, and it, it was a gathering of, of musicians and radicals. Um, Woody, Woody Guthrie was, at, you know, at, it was was uh, living there, married to a dancer from the Martha Grand troupe, uh, which is why he's he's all these Jewish songs. In case you don't know, Guthrie wrote all these songs with, with smatterings of Yiddish and Hebrew and about Hanukkah songs because his, his spouse was Jewish and a dancer with Martha Graham. So yeah, you're right. and, and uh, the great the great Hudy Ledbetter, Ledbelly, and his wife Martha were living there. Um, Pete Seeger was like 18 years old and hanging hanging around with them. And then there were all these upper class women from uh, the Upper East Side who were down there working in the settlement schools and who had radical politics not shared by their spouses. So it's a very interesting time. And at some point, and then, and then there's Aunt Molly straight out of Eastern Kentucky with a drawl you wouldn't believe. And um, someday, somebody tape recorder telling, telling, telling that they, they, we don't actually even know who did the recordings. And uh, but, but talking about her life and times, and the tapes got lost. And they were discovered like 30 years later. And there were these old celluloid types that, that and the rats had been into. But they're only little fragments and stretches. But they, they did what they could with them. And there was one fragment that runs for about six minutes that, that, um, that it's on, they're all on a, on a LP that you can get from the Smithsonian as a, as a CD today called Songs and Stories of Aunt Molly Jackson. And uh, over the years I realized that pieces of what she had said were creeping into my conversation. So when somebody would ask me something, I'd say what Aunt Molly said on this tape. I thought, you know, like Joan Armatrady says, if you're going to do it, do it right. So, I learned this piece, and I, so I want to I wanna say it for you as, as a piece of uh, history and oral history. So, so here's what I want you to imagine. This is, you, get, you get a sense of her from looking up there. High cheekbones, lean, leathery. Um, she would have been wearing you know, a cotton print dress, buttoned down the front, probably down to about her calves. She had um, kind of iron gray hair, and she wore it pulled very, very tight back and, and, and knotted in a bun at the back of her head. And I want you to imagine her in what Monkey Wrench would have looked like in 1930. Right? So it's, it's like a, an apartment inhabited by radicals on the Lower East Side. So there's posters everywhere. You know, there's, there's coffee cups stuffed with cigarette butts, those being the days. And there's leaflets and flyers and, you know, all, all the archaeological digs of the movement. And Aunt Moe is sitting on a sofa like this. Somebody's dragged it in off the sidewalk. <laughs> You know, except it probably is a print sofa, and uh, she's sitting very straight. Somebody puts a microphone in front of her and says, "So, Aunt Molly, tell us what it was like back back in, in Kentucky in the '30s when you were organizing for the union and being a midwife and writing all those wonderful songs." And she looks off in the distance and she says. To heaven something to eat in Kentucky when the miners was all blacklisted and no work. So I said, if I lost my life, that I would do anything in this world that I could in order to keep the children from suffering. So there was a young family that lived just below me that had one child. I'd heard that child crying for days. 
And I went down and I said to the mother, what is the matter with your child, Daisy? She's, she's a crying. She said, she, Aunt Bolly, she said, she's a crying for something to eat. She's hungry and I don't have a thing. I said, is it possible, you people, that I will do more for your children than you will do yourselves? I said, in the, in the name of common sense, have you got a, a, a feed sack or, 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 or a sugar sack or, or, or something to give me? Yes, she said. I took that sugar sack and I went back to the house. Me being a midwife, I had a permit to carry me a gun. Had a good 38 special that I'd used for my protection through them hills for 15 years then. And I put it under my arm and I put the coat on over it. And I started down to the commissary, down to the company store. But by the time I got to the foot of the hill, there was another family of children that was a crying, all small children, seven children. I said to the mother, what is the matter with your children, Ann? That was Bob Stringer's wife, a good, hard-working man, and kept his family plenty when he was allowed to work. She said, Molly, they're, they're crying for something. I said, come on, to my little son, Henry Jackson. I said, come on and go with me. I walked into the commissary, and I walked in laughing. And I said to the commissary clerk, well, Mr. Martin, it don't make any difference how hard times gets. I can always find a little money or a little scrip or something to get by with, I said. Give me a 24-pound sack of flour. He handed me over the 24-pound sack of flour and I took it. And I gave it to my little son. I said, Henry, walk out and take this, take this sack of flour. Walk out and wait for me by the tipple. That was where they weighed and washed the coal and loaded it into the coal cars. 